Fine. Let me uh, welcome all uh, and uh, kick off this meeting. As you know, this is the culmination meeting of a round of webinars that we did on answering the question, uh, the world without a WTO. And following that, uh, we have published a discussion paper, which has also been circulated for your uh, benefit. Uh, I mean, just to read the abstract from the same, uh, during the first half of the 20th century, the world had witnessed some disruptions, including two large scale wars. Uh, international trade suffered most, uh, particularly in the run up to and as an aftermath of the Great Depression of the early 1930s. There were no multilaterally agreed rules to arrest that decline. After almost a century, are we going to witness a similar scare. Following the Sino-American trade wars, which have been continuing over the last few years, Brexit, the US withdrawal from the TPP, and India's withdrawal from the RCEP, uh, this question is in the mind of every right-thinking person across the world. The COVID-19 pandemic and its likely aftermath in further disrupting the existing geopolitical and geoeconomic equilibrium however so ever imperfect they might be, along with the largely dysfunctional World Trade Organization, which is unable to discharge one of its most important functions, uh, the dispute settlement, the world is likely to witness many more trade-related disruptions. Recent export restrictions on essential medicines and other medical equipment and food items by many countries provide some directions towards an emerging beggar thy neighbor world. Can humanity afford such a disruptive world? While a simple answer is no, and there is hardly any effort on the parts of global leaders, there are no statesmen. To stem this thought, the onus for reviving the multilateral trading system lies equally with the global trade community at large. That calls for the only multilateralism to survive on the ongoing onslaught against it but also and more importantly under a new normal of polylateralism, an idea which is floated by Pascal in this uh, webinar series, uh, where governments, businesses, and civil society work together in a structured manner. A rules-based multilateral system is an absolute necessity for this to happen in a balanced and equitable manner. This is because there is no denying the fact that it is this system that underlines peace, security, stability, and prosperity in the post-war world. Therefore, other than providing a historical narrative of the multilateral trading system under the GATT and its success in the WTO, the discussion paper analyzes a forward-looking agenda for the multilateral trading system to reinvent itself in a new avatar. And this agenda is based on, as I said, a series of webinars organized by us uh, held across the world uh, during April to September 2020. This, it concludes by arguing that while different systems of economic and political governance can coexist, it is important for the global powers to understand the value of agreeing to disagree. And it is the responsibility of the middle and emerging powers to convince them about this. With that, let me welcome you all once again and hand over the, uh, the discussions to Pascal for his response. Thanks a lot. Uh, for whatever reason, I've lost a, a number of pictures, but that's life. I can see you. So if I say stupid things, I'll uh, have to detect this on your uh, body language. So let me start this conversation uh, just by uh, congratulating uh, Kat uh, for having uh, collected uh, such a rich uh, material uh, with uh, very different views, with uh, seminars on different uh, continents, which I think uh, give us a pretty large, comprehensive picture of the problem uh, you wanted to uh, highlight, uh, and which is uh, whether or not uh, this world can live uh, without a, a world trade organization. Uh, 
WTO being a sort of a proxy uh, for what uh, we uh, trademarks uh, call the RBMTS, uh, which is a bit of a longer acronym than World Trade Organization. Uh, RBMTS uh, meaning rules-based multilateral uh, trading system. Uh, I think uh, you've uh, produced a piece uh, which uh, pretty convincingly uh, argues uh, that uh, in reality uh, TNA, to pursue with acronyms, there is no alternative uh, and that uh, other systems of organizing uh, trade relations between nations or not organizing uh, trade relations uh, between nations are uh, all uh, uh, alternatives uh, which are uh, worse, more costly, uh, more dangerous, more unequal, more unbalanced, more unfair than what we have, although recognizing that what we have is far from perfect, uh, as uh, evidence in this uh, recent uh, COVID uh, crisis, uh, which for some of us uh, is past, and I'm thinking of a part of Asia, and for, for many of us is still uh, in the making, unfortunately, and this is uh, true uh, for roughly uh, the rest of the world, but China and a few bright spots like um, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, Korea, or uh, French uh, Caledonia in the Pacific. So thanks for having done that. Uh, I will just uh, put a few things on the table so that we can start our dialogue. Uh, it's one thing uh, saying we need a rules-based multilateral system. In other words, a WTO, which is a rule book on the one side, and a machinery uh, to make sure that this uh, rules books is implemented, uh, whether through monitoring, uh, peer review, uh, uh, expertise from the Secretariat, or whether uh, through uh, enforcement, such as uh, the dispute settlement system, that's one thing. The next question, and this of course uh, is uh, also part of the development uh, which you've devoted in your final piece. Uh, another thing is uh, to make sure that the system is up to its task, which for the moment, frankly speaking, is not the case. And this takes us to WTO reform, uh, which is uh, the code name for improving the multilateral uh, trading system we have. And I see that developing in two directions. And my main point of this first comment, uh, Pradeep, uh, will be uh, that you've only addressed the first part of the equation, whereas I believe there are two parts of this equation. WTO reforms, in my view, is both an issue of software and an issue of hardware. Software is the rule book, the principles, the agreements, the way we deal multilaterally with obstacles to trade. And there's quite a lot of items on the to-do list, uh, but there's also a hardware issue, uh, which I insist on, uh, and uh, I'm probably the only one on this planet to insist so heavily in this, and maybe because I was a DG of WTO during eight years, uh, which is uh, the way this organization works. And my point, and I'll stop there, uh, this uh, first reaction uh, to what you've put on the table, uh, the hardware issue is not properly highlighted. It's not properly diagnosed, it's not properly addressed a fortiori, and there is a big task to make sure that this organization works, whereas for the moment, the working of the system uh, is not uh, all right, and in a nutshell, 
<clears throat> I can enter into more details if necessary in a nutshell. I believe, and this will not surprise some of you around this uh, digital table, uh, member states have too much of a say and uh, the Secretariat has too little of a say. In other words, WTO is still too much of an organization and not yet enough of an institution. That's my first reaction uh, to uh, what uh, you've uh, tabled, Pradeep. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, Pascal, for these uh, opening remarks. And indeed, uh, the point which you made at towards the end in the context of the not enough attention having been paid to the hardware, it would be interesting to hear from uh, Alejandro, who had also participated in the webinar, uh, the one of the first webinars, as to what, what would his response be in terms of the question that you raised uh, in terms of hardware. Alejandro? Oh, thank you very much. And, and <clears throat> hello, Pascal. Uh, hello. Very interesting uh, exercise that you have uh, undertaken throughout these months. Very useful, by the way. And I, I would just like to uh, underscore what uh, Pascal just said, just to uh, give, give by way of an example, uh, something which strikes me. Uh, one frequently heard criticism of the WTO from many members is uh, the lack of transparency. And the first thing that comes to mind is because countries don't always notify. When they do, sometimes it's late and certainly almost always incomplete. Uh, having said that, when one looks at what should be notified, the language in the text is sometimes very vague. But in any case, we're talking here about an instrument to achieve transparency, which is technology of the 1950s. Uh, when today, as because of Pascal's initiative during the financial crisis, uh, the Secretariat undertook to illustrate, to inform government by collecting the relevant information about the trade measures, whether restricted or liberalizing that we are what's being applied worldwide. And, you know, there's a lot that the secretary can do in terms of providing members with better information, well organized so that it can be useful and thus achieving the ultimate objective of transparency, which is at the basis of any uh, minimum trust uh, within uh, within the organization. So it's not that Secretariat could do the job of members, but certainly the Secretariat could do it and probably should do more. And, you know, the technology is there. So it, it amazes me uh, at the, the discussion, which is which is relying on, on the realities of 1947 and not of present times. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, may I request Hamid? Okay, I, I I would respond to what Pascal said by uh, by a, a big nod and and agreement because I think uh, uh, even when we work together, uh, we come from a time where the Secretariat used to play uh, an important role. This mantra about the WTO being member driven, I think, is a is a reality, and members always have the the ultimate authority. But the Secretariat always uh, had a very important role to play as a unique repository of world-class expertise that can provide the right analysis, collect information, and provide a backdrop for useful discussions. But um, this needs to be approved by, by the membership. Is there a lot to do? Absolutely. And as Alejandro said, uh, technologies now provide uh, uh, tools that were not available before that can provide uh, uh, additional uh, inputs from the Secretariat while maintaining, of course, the, the neutrality and, and, uh, and impartiality of the Secretariat. But the point I want to stress here is that uh, while this is uh, definitely something that has to be agreed by the membership, it's also something that um, requires some kind of a tone setting by the head of the Secretariat. Uh, and uh, I remember when Pascal was there, um, 
the tone was set, but but then um, that was not the situation afterwards. I don't mean to point fingers at anybody, but it is something that should be also considered as we go forward. Now, that's that's my response to, to, to Pascal's point about the software and the hardware, and I, I completely agree with that. Uh, the, the, the only thing that I would add here is that when we, when we look at uh, WTO reform, uh, I, would, I would always suggest that we take this as a, as a holistic uh, vision in which we place the different, different parts because a lot of the discussions that I have um, uh, participated in so far has been taking bits and pieces, but we need to have a conceptual framework. And I think uh, from what I heard so far and from your introduction, Pradeep, uh, I would definitely congratulate you on this sort of sound conceptual approach that you're taking. So back to you. Thank you very much, Hamid. Uh, uh, may I request Raiko? Raiko? Hello, how are you? Uh, very thank good. you for the opportunity to comment. I didn't realize I was going to be given an opportunity to say anything. I was very keen to listen to yeah. you. Um, and Mr. Pascal and everybody speaking, as you know, um, I'm not an expert uh, expert on uh, uh, international economics or trade. I'm a competition authority. But I would like to uh, say it's very encouraging that uh, you and um, everybody, uh, the uh, distinguished uh, panelists are talking about this. And as an economist, I've, over, I've been very concerned where WTO is go, seemed to be heading or lost its way. And I'm very keen to hear um, the, um, what people have to say and maybe from the competition of the point of view, what I could add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Dira Singh? Uh, Pradeep ji, I, I would like to only compliment uh, all of you for re actually raising this issue. It's a it's a politically sensitive issue to raise in terms of uh, the role of WTO and also the fact of the reforms that are needed there. I agree with the discussion as it is happening, but basically want to point out that WTO is nothing but one more organization in the global context of the global trading system that we set up and the global political system that was set up 70 years ago. That is now at question. It is being looked at, it is being reviewed, and we are seeing a, a whole historical questioning of everything that has happened in the past 70 years. So please bear this in mind when we look at any context of reform and any context of changes in the system that we are talking about. Thank you. Let me pick up the point made by Dr. Dira Singh. He is a former administrative service officer in India, and he used to be secretary general of FIKI, uh, uh, one of our leading business chambers, and he is now a distinguished fellow at CUTS. Uh, you know, the question which he raised is something where we heard also participated in another webinar we had done on multilateralism. And in the context of uh, the Joe Biden regime, likely Joe Biden regime, because Trump has still not given up, and uh, one hears uh, all kinds of stories, uh, but is there a light at the end of the tunnel with the new regime in the US if the new regime comes in? Or if the old regime continues, what would happen? I'll start from the previous uh, point made by uh, Dr. Dinant Singh, uh, which is that this issue of what about WTO has now come to the fore of an international and even in some cases of a national conversation. And I think the root of this uh, sort of new visibility, uh, which, which you address uh, in, your, in your piece, uh, come from uh, two uh, different developments that have taken place for the last uh, 20 years. The first one is bad news, which is that uh, the World Trade Organization has not succeeded in those last 20 years uh, to update the WTO rulebook in order uh, to factor in uh, changes which have taken place 
uh, in the world economy, and in particular in the area of obstacle to trade, uh, which is uh, the real issue. Uh, I mean, a rules-based multilateral trading system means addressing obstacle to trade, reducing them, getting rid of them in a rules fair balanced way in order to open trade. So bad news is that the capacity of the system to adjust to new reality has not delivered. We still live with rules of global trade that date uh, from, mid, from the mid 90s. And whether it's about uh, climate, uh, whether it's about data, whether it's about subsidies, uh, there is an obvious discrepancy between the historical context in which those rules were put together and the reality of today's world. That's the bad news. First development. Second development is the good news, uh, which is that uh, we have been living uh, for the last four years uh, with a US president uh, who decided to kill the WTO. Uh, as surprising as it may be, given uh, the major role uh, which the US have played in setting up the system, <laughs> in building up, uh, Donald Trump was elected uh, on a protectionist platform uh, it was the first time since 1900 any US president was elected on a protectionist platform. And he did or tried to do uh, what he said he would do, i.e. Uh, America first, and switch uh, from a rules-based system to an arm-twisting system. Now, the good news is that he did not succeed. There may be bad reasons for which it did not succeed, which is that the system is a bit like a, you know, like a pillar. Uh, it's, it's not very solid, it's, it's, it's a bit softy, softy. So punching on a pillar usually doesn't give a lot of results. But there are good reasons for which he did not succeed, which is that for a vast majority of countries on this planet, the Trump way was the wrong way. And I think this part of good news is also one of the reasons why now uh, we are talking about uh, the reform of the, of the WTO, which I think is a higher topic than before. And I'm glad about this uh, because uh, we need it. And in a way, I think the Trump tunnel uh, uh, for, uh, for the WTO is a lesson that tells us that there is, there is an end to this tunnel. And to answer your question, although uh, we have to wait uh, until January uh, to have a more detailed view of what the Biden administration agenda is about international trade, I know for sure from the contacts I have, and everybody will understand that, that I have uh, more friends around uh, Biden than I had uh, friends around Trump. Uh, this is uh, no surprise for anybody, I hope. Uh, what I know is that at least the intention of the new US administration is to go back to the WTO table. I don't think a series of problems with the US have with the existing system, starting uh, with the conditions uh, of competition uh, with uh, China in open trade will disappear. And by the way, as you know, and I've said that publicly many times, I share part of these concerns. So the problems will not evaporate, but we will have a way to tackle them, to discuss them, to address them, to negotiate them, which is uh, different than uh, using the WO as a punching ball, even if this punching ball, as I said, has reasonably resisted during these four years. Uh, if anybody else has a, any issue to be raised, they are welcome. Yeah, Hamid. Thank you, Pradeep. And I, I, I agree again with, with what Pascal was just saying about the tendency of the new administration to be more inclined towards the WTO and multilateralism in, in, in general, not just in, in the trade field. <clears throat> but a question 
to, to Pascal, perhaps. Uh, at this particular time uh, in the process, because until we have a new USDR, it's not going to be um, until spring. Uh, in the meantime, um, do you see that there, there, there may be some useful efforts that um, the, 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 those who care about the system, those who are the friends of the system, starting with the EU and, and, and others, is there something that can be done in the meantime to start encouraging the new administration to be forthcoming uh, uh, instead, of, of, instead of sitting and waiting um, to see what, uh, what will come from Washington by next spring and therefore be just purely reactive. I mean, what useful things can be done now? That, that's my practical question. Let me answer this uh, uh, in uh, sort of two short points. Uh, first, there is in the WTO an ongoing negotiation which has accelerated in uh, recent times about WTO disciplines on fish subsidies. Now, I know it's an issue on which uh, India uh, is not that uh, enthusiastic, or at least uh, India would accept uh, disciplines uh, in the WTO that would bite in uh, non-Indian fishery subsidies, but as little as possible on Indian fishery subsidies, which I will be told this is a normal Vestalian behavior. But I'm, I'm mentioning this point, which has not attracted a lot of public attention because there is, for the first time since a long time, a reasonable probability of finishing a negotiation in the WTO that has been going on for a long time. And I think doing this now, at a time where a US administration is reconsidering its relationship with the WTO. But knowing that, because this did not get the attention of Trump, it was reasonably safety man safely managed, uh, the US have been in favor of stop discipline for a long time. So I'm putting a sort of, you know, the sort of one penny in the machine that uh, showing to the US that you can do something in WTO in an area where the US has been pushing for getting something done would be a sort of good appetizer. It will not be a, a, a profound reform of WTO. <laughs> we clearly need more than that. So that's, that's my first you know, short term little thing, but which might change the ambience. Second is, of course, uh, that in the meantime, uh, we need uh, to make sure uh, that the necessary contacts are taking place uh, between uh, the incoming administration, uh, the EU and China. Uh, this uh, remains, in my view, uh, the fundamental uh, triangle uh, for uh, progress uh, in the WTO, not least because of the big bearing of the uh, US, China, geopolitical, geoeconomic, geostrategic, geotechnological rivalry, uh, which is here to stay. And uh, we need to find within this rivalry, uh, we need to find a sort of bridge that addresses the problems with the US have with China and the problems which China have with the US through the sort of mediation of the European Union, who has, let's say, uh, uh, consideration uh, for both sides, and who, in the area of trade, uh, is the sort of brokering entity uh, which we need. Uh, and I think uh, this uh, has uh, shown in recent years, including when the EU was asked uh, to uh, set up uh, this uh, dispute uh, settlement uh, system, uh, which is apart from the official one, but which allows for a number of disputes uh, to keep uh, moving uh, with the countries that have decided uh, to join uh, this sort of provisional dispute settlement system. So my second answer uh, to uh, Hamid is that in the meantime, EU 
and China should deploy the uh, necessary uh, uh, contacts with uh, the uh, transition uh, team on the Biden side so that the major issue which will have to be dealt with and which is uh, a recognition by China uh, that uh, we need more of what they call competitive neutrality in international trade, i.e. disciplines on what we Europeans call state aids, is uh, advanced. Uh, whether China is or not ready to do that, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure China would not have done that uh, with the uh, Trump president of the US uh, uh, because they uh, hate uh, losing the face and uh, they uh, like uh, cooking deals, uh, which uh, give the impression uh, that uh, you're not paying, but the other one is paying, which is what the Chinese have done very cleverly in this sort of uh, so-called first phase agreement uh, with the uh, Trump administration. So I think we need to convince the Chinese that they have to move on this. And I think a joint non-aggressive US EU pressure in the name of we need more disciplines on state aid if we want not only to keep opening trade with China but to keep trade open with China is uh, the urgency uh, and of course uh, contacts uh, should be taken in my view in this direction uh, we as you know uh, don't have yet uh, a DG uh, of WTO that would be able to discreetly uh, behind the scene, uh, if not organize, uh, at least uh, be part of this uh, contact as a sort of uh, trustee uh, by the players, uh, and this is in a way uh, regrettable. That would be my that would be my answer to your question, uh, Hamid. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, I notice it's Toral here, Toral. Thank, thank you, Pradeep, for inviting me. I'm, I'm on from Norway, Oslo, Norway. Uh, I have a few observations, and one in particular referring to, uh, first of all, the WTO's uh, belonging into a family of multilateral regimes uh, related to Trump's election victory and almost repeating victory on the back of frustrated workers in the United States. They claim, and he on their behalf, claimed that the competition under the auspices of the WTO is unfair to American workers, and one might ask to workers in developed countries in general. Do they have a point? And if so, what needs to be done? Thank you. They have a point, and we all in the Western world, and I put EU in this category, uh, as well as uh, Norway, we all have had problems in adjusting uh, to the uh, rapid, much more rapid uh, than was expected, uh, penetration of China uh, in, uh, in the world economy. Uh, we have registered huge benefits from that. Uh, remember when China joined WTO, its external trade surplus was 10% of its GNP. 20 years later, its external trade surplus is 1% of its GNP. And what this says is that this melting of 9% of the GNP of China, which is now a huge quantity, shows that uh, imports into China have grown more rapidly than exports of China to the rest of the world. This is the macro picture. Now, of course, like always in uh, opening trade, uh, which as often said, uh, works uh, according to a Ricardo Schumpeterian model. Uh, it's efficient because it's painful and it's painful because it is efficient. And of course, the pain is in many cases not properly distributed among uh, the actors of the system. And American workers like uh, European workers uh, have been have been hit by a competition in areas where China was using its made comparative advantage at the time, uh, which was a, a low cost of labor, which led to either displacing production or 
uh, importing uh, goods that were not produced anymore where they used to be produced before. Nothing surprising on this. The experience shows that this reality has been addressed more or less well, depending on countries. I've often uh, taken the example of the end of the multi-fiber agreement uh, in, uh, in the late uh, 90s and beginning of uh, the years uh, 2000. And I, if I take this example, and uh, notably in the case of Europe, uh, it was the same trade regime for all EU members. They got the same opening of the textile and clothing trade regime. Some of them suffered a lot. Countries like Portugal, like Italy, for instance. Others did not, like uh, uh, Sweden uh, or Finland or Denmark. Uh, uh, the so South suffered, the North did not. And the real reason behind this is that uh, countries in the northern part of Europe were better prepared. Uh, they had prepared strategies for that. They have social security systems or systems to reduce social insecurity, which are thicker than elsewhere. Their adjustment has been better. So in the case of the US, and, and I'm uh, finishing to answer your question, yes, uh, workers in the old industry in the US, in the old part of the economy, which is, by the way, where there is uh, the largest rate of unionization, uh, because the US legislation is uh, such that you can unionize relatively easily in the old economy and mu much more difficulty in the new economy, been hit. But this is largely a problem that has to do with the low capacity of the US system, and notably of the US uh, welfare system, uh, to deal with this sort of shock. I think the lesson to be drawn from this experience is not that we should not open trade. We should not renounce to the efficiencies it creates, because at the end of the day, this is growth and welfare, and notably uh, for poorer countries and poorer people. But we should look at the other side of the problem, which is how to better cope with these transformations, which, as we all know, go together with other major transformations, which trade opening sometimes fosters, such as uh, technological change, such as digitalization, which are issues which are as big on an agenda to adjust our workforce in a socially fair way than just trade opening. Thank you very much, Pascal. With that, uh, we come to an end of this conversation. You have to go for your next meeting. And may I request Bipul, uh, Bipul Chatterjee, my colleague, to propose a vote of thanks and share his own views. Bipul? Uh, I would just pick up one point from Mr. Lamy's, uh, I mean, thoughts. There is no alternative. Absolutely. There is no alternative to the WTO. We all understand that. But at the same time, we don't do anything. We don't do much. So that is the larger political question that uh, I would like to pose. So let me propose, other than proposing the vote of thanks, uh, just uh, two loud thoughts. One is that let there be, I mean, Mr. Lamy and many other experts have been talking about these WTO reforms. So let me propose that let there be an eminent persons group. And by eminent persons, I mean all living WTO DGs who have been retired. Let them come out with this conceptual framework for software as well as hardware reforms in the WTO system. And my second point is, while I'm sure that they're going to come out with a very good uh, package of proposals and that will be debated, but that has to be taken at the political level. And there I don't know. I mean, we need a number of Mr. Keynes. I don't see one Mr. Keynes in, in today's world. So maybe we can have another group of having politicians like Mr. Walmart, Dr. Manmohan Singh, and people like them. Uh, I mean, these are some couple of names which are coming to my mind uh, loudly. So maybe the time has come to uh, think along those lines. With that, let me thank all of you. 
and we are going to send this uh, discussion paper all over the world and i'm sure that that will raise further debates on this subject thank you very much thanks uh, very much for the for organizing this and inviting me thank you thank you very much so, good uh, morning uh, afternoon uh, evening wherever you are and i can think of the three looking at this uh, screen Bye, Pradeep, and thanks again. Bye, bye. bye. Uh, as we say in, in, in Hindi, we say Namaskar at, at any time of the day, whether you welcome somebody or you wish goodbye to somebody. Absolutely. It's a very universal sign of greeting, and particularly in the current pandemic days. We don't see, stop shaking hands also. Thank you very much. <laughs>